So, Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We do pray you'd open our hearts afresh to you this evening. And <laughs> what do you know? Here we are in Deuteronomy 21, and we've got these surrounding neighbors of Israel, or at least Israel coming into the land, who want to attack them. Imagine that. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And Lord, as you have delivered Israel out of many things in the past, we trust even now as we see what look like God-sized problems forming, that you will deliver them out of the trouble in their present. Because you have promised that Israel will remain in their land, or at least a remnant, until the time that you have sent your son to establish his throne on your holy hill in Jerusalem. And so we wait, Lord, with expectant hearts. We are concerned about those in harm's way in Lebanon, in Gaza, in Iran, and also in Israel. And we pray, Father, the Prince of Peace, uh, Lord, would come and put things right. Work in our hearts this evening, Lord. Bless your word to your people and strengthen their walk, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so chapter 21, we started into this a bit. And don't worry, I'm not going to show you slides from a camping trip to Nova Scotia or wherever. Not that people in Nova Scotia should email me and be angry as though I denigrate going to Nova Scotia. If you remember, we're at Kadesh. We're having some problems again. Moses got himself in some trouble. And so then they went to, can everybody see that? Yeah, me neither. They went to uh, the area here of, oh boy, let's get off kilter, to Mount Hor. And Aaron died there. Remember that? How many have I lost already? Wonderful. Chapter 21. And when King Arod, by the way, this area is, how many have been to the Bedouin tent experience? Those who've been there always finish the word experience because it is an experience. It's here in Arad where we had our Bedouin tent experience. And so this name of Arad showing up here, uh, but uh, this is the king around from which perhaps it is named. Arad meaning a wild donkey. And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies. And we showed you last time, here is the, right on the map, way of the spies. This, by the way, these little crinklies aren't that my camera's losing its mind. This is actually a relief map to give you an idea of the depth. Here's the Dead Sea, roughly now almost 1,400 feet below sea level. Um, this is the ridge that goes along up into Jerusalem came by the way of the spies. Then he fought, verse 1, chapter 21, against Israel and took some of them prisoners. Again, imagine that. It happened again on October 7th. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of that place Hormah, which is right here. Can you guys actually see some of this? Yeah. Well, it's not terrible. In the back, you probably can't, but Horma, just down the road from Arad, where we stay at the Bedouin tent experience. You have to be there to appreciate it. And they journeyed from Mount Hor. So back down here to Mount Hor. They journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. So the Red Sea's down here. So it's basically a southern trajectory that they're taking. By the way, the Red Sea, ah, to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. So they're working their way through here. And the people spake against God and against Moses. <laughs> this is like 38, 39 years in now, almost the 40th year here. And long ago, when we were planting, and we rented the senior center, and then we rented the Montgomery School and all that. And, and the church is very small. And on 9-11, we actually gathered everybody in our what is our side yard and brought everybody quick, bring lawn chairs. We need to pray for the country. And so back then, early on, a lot of people knew where we live, and some people still do. But often what would happen is I'd be working full time and trying to cut my lawn. You know, it's an evening like tonight, trying to get the lawn done. And somebody would pull up, hop out, and they, they got, you know, something's on fire in their world. And... And uh, they want to talk. And so I'd watch the sun go down. My lawn's half cut. 
My neighbor is a fantastic neighbor. We've been neighbors for 20, 28 years, uh, roughly. And, um, but he, he always mows his lawn the same, and it's always like perfect. And there was a period of years where half my lawn would get cut. And he'd drive to work, and he'd look out at my yard like, you know. And, and that was because I, I would get interrupted in cutting my lawn because somebody found me in my tractor and would start talking. And, and so it happened, and then they'd come back with something. And, and my wife used to, um, she'd say, look, do me a favor. Just get a little cassette recorder. They show up. Hit record. Have the discussion. When, they, when they're done, hit, it, hit stop. And when they leave, and in a week when they come back, not having heard anything you told them about from the word and everything else, when they come back, say, hang on. Go in the house, get the recorder, hit play, and finish the lawn. In other words, we just keep hearing this song and dance over and over again. So here we are 40 years in, and what do you know? The people are speaking against God. They're speaking against Moses like this is something new. You can see Moses like, oh, you know, they're coming back to him. And wherefore has the Lord brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? How long have they been in the wilderness? 40 years. Has he taken care of them? So that's incorrect. Wherefore us, the Lord brought us. You know, you could have gone into the land, but no, you didn't want to listen to them. So wherefore has the Lord brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? Actually, that was your choice. For there is no bread, yet you guys aren't dead. Neither is there any water. Well, that's factually incorrect because you haven't died. And our soul loathes this light bread. Wait a minute, there's no bread, but we don't like the bread. Am I the only one? That supernatural bread that's been showing up every morning for 40 years. And the Lord sent fiery serpents. Now we have two words here. The first one is nakash. Try it. And that is literally serpent, nakash. But here it's translated fiery. The second word, serpents, is seraph. Try that one. How many have heard of a seraphim? Seraphims means burning ones. And so, literally, the order of words here is serpent fiery. But for sake of English, they reverse them. The Lord sent fiery serpents, but serpent fiery, if you take it literally, among the people. And so the question comes up, what kind of fiery serpents? Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown in the 1880s, they say that Boschert, one historian, claimed, and others think as well, it's the hydrus whose sting will inflame, produce a fiery eruption that becomes followed by an intolerable thirst, swelling throughout the body, which eventually terminates in death. Let me translate. You don't die as soon as you're bitten. It takes a little time. The Bedouins have their own opinion, according to other historians, Alfred Edersheim. That is, there's a mottled snake that has fiery spots on its back. They claim they're very numerous, and they are quite afraid of them. Now, I know what you're thinking. You are never going to get me to that Bedouin tent experience. Sure we will. We've never had a problem with this. So one or the other, these things bite you, and without some kind of intervention, most people succumb to the bite. It's lethal. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. These things just start showing up, kind of like the frogs did in Egypt. And they bit the people. Much of the people moothed. You know that means died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Moses prayed for the people. One, we have sinned. That's called confession. Two, we've spoken against the Lord and against you. That's repentance. We are out of order. Three, pray to the Lord for us. In other words, we seek forgiveness and healing. A very simple progression. You confess you're a sinner. You put your trust in Jesus. You ask him to help you turn from a life that he has to judge to a life that he can bless, and he will help you, and he'll begin to heal those areas of your lives. Very simple progression. Confession followed with repentance, this idea of forgiveness and healing coming into their lives. I was wrong. I've been the fence. God helped me to change, and he'll change you. And so Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, <clears throat> make thee a fiery serpent. That word this time is simply seraph, fiery. And set it upon a pole. Well, how did they do it? Some say they did it like this. Others say they hung it over like that. We find out we get to heaven because Hezekiah broke it. We'll get to that in a minute. Set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass 
that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, what? Shall live. And what if they don't want to? There's always one, right? And what if they don't want to? Well, you tell me what if they don't want to. What happens? You move. You're dead. Now, how many of you have already done the math in your head and said, what kind of idiot wouldn't knowing like, ah, mm, wouldn't go and look and be healed? How many? How many? You know, I kind of enjoy the burn. It makes absolutely no sense why you would not say, oh my goodness, this is going to kill me. And look, yes. Well, first history, 2 Kings 18. First, we've got to deal with history. 2 Kings 18, to the right. Hit Chronicles, go to the left. Hit Samuel, go to the right. Hit 18, you made it. 2 Kings 18, now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. He did that which, was, that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. And he removed the high places, break down the images, and cut down the groves, all idolatry, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Verse 4. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense unto it. They turned it into an idol. Now, it's hard to imagine taking a symbol of salvation from sin or from death and turning it into an icon or an idol. I mean, I know it's hard to imagine. A church would never do that, would it? And he broke it. He called it Nehushtan, a thing of brass. And they broke it. So he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So one, it eventually turns into an idol that Hezekiah has to destroy. Two, the rest of you are waiting for me in John chapter 3. John's Gospel, chapter 3. New Testament. Page 1590 for some of you. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. That is quite the endorsement. And why has he come to that conviction? He answers it. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. That's amazing. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> that which is born of the flesh is flesh, physical birth. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, spiritual birth. Marvel not that I said unto you, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. And so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto, them, unto him, Art thou a master, teacher, is the idea of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. <clears throat> if I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, meditate on this when you get home, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, but he's in a room with Nicodemus. Have fun with that at home. And how our verse. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Question. Why did he lift up the serpent? Because God told him to. Why did God tell him to lift up a serpent? Because the people were dying. 
Why were the people dying? Because they had sinned against God. What happens if the people look to that serpent? They were healed and spared or saved from that death. Now that we've been through Deuteronomy 20 or Numbers 21, you now know the backstory of what was happening when Moses raised up that serpent in the wilderness. It was God's solution to their rebellion. It was God's open door to salvation to whomsoever would look. He was not only rescuing Israel from the rebellion, he was again establishing a type that his own son would take up to explain that your salvation is not based on your works. Your salvation is based on when you trust God and look to him by faith to heal you from your sin, which you have inflicted on yourself by being in rebellion to God. The moment you disobeyed your parents, you broke one of the Ten Commandments. The moment you lied about disobeying your parents, you broke two of the Ten Commandments. The moment you coveted your buddy who lied about disobeying his parents, you broke three of the commandments, and on we go. And God has to judge it. But he made a way. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man, that is Jesus referring to himself, who, by the way, is the fulfillment of Daniel 7. That's what he means by calling himself the Son of Man. I have to help you out. That's the one who comes to the Ancient of Days, whose throne is a fiery flame, and to the Son of Man brought before the Ancient of Days is given a rod to judge all nations, and Daniel's told his kingdom will have no end. He is the rock cut without human hands, from creation, yet divinely brought forth. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. So as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth, just like those people in the wilderness, if you'll turn and look from your heart, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, you know this, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth looks to him in faith. Believing in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, if you will look to him, in faith. He that believeth, by the way, notice, uh, verse 15 believeth, verse 16 believeth, verse, eight, verse 18 believeth. It's almost like he's trying to tell you the way to be saved is believeth. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Hallelujah, that's me. Anybody else join me? He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Back to Numbers 21 in our mind. How could you not look to that serpent after you've been bit? You'd be crazy. And yet so many people say, well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. Hoy, well, then you got nothing. You got nothing. How can you say that? Acts 4.12, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but the name Jesus of Nazareth, who, by the way, told us he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. Why? Because he's the one who's raised up like Moses raised up the serpent. And when you look to him in faith, hoping for his forgiveness, asking for his forgiveness of your sin, he will forgive you and he will give you eternal life. It's a simple transaction. Well, that's too easy. Is it? Then why isn't the whole world saved? Oh, good point. All right, then. It's about the heart. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world, John 3, 19. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Even so, every one that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Nicodemus leaves, and at that point in John's gospel, we get no indication that by George he got it. Yet, however, you go to the end of John's gospel, he shows up to help Joseph of Arimathea bury his body. And he willingly renders himself ceremonially unclean to help bury that body. So by the end of the gospel, by George, Nicodemus got it. 
But you know he left that meeting. As Moses raised up the serpent. Moses raised up the serpent. You've heard the blasphemy. We have no further need of witnesses. What say ye? asked Caiaphas. Crucify him, they said. They began to spit in his face and pluck out his beard. Early that morning, very early, they assembled some semblance of quorum of the Sanhedrin, condemned him, and took him to Pilate. By finally 9 a.m., they got him on a cross. Six hours later, 3 p.m., he surrendered his spirit. It's not a lot of time, but it's enough time to go, he's been lifted up. He's been lifted up. And to lift him up, they had to pierce his hands and feet. Now you're in Psalm 22. They divided his garments. Now you're in Psalm 22, which they knew was messianic. They're mocking him with the very statements they said he would mock him with, Psalm 22. He's dying between thieves, Isaiah 53. There's a lot that was happening in that time. I look forward to getting to heaven and talking with Joseph of Arimathea and with Nicodemus. I'll tell you why I think Joseph of Arimathea was able to boldly go in. Because he realized there's a rich, a rich man. He's going to be buried with the rich. I'm a rich man. I got a tomb. Never mind he's from Arimathea. Normally you get buried in your hometown. He's got a tomb right near where they crucify people. That's another question I have when I get to heaven. What do you do with a tomb in that part of town when you're from miles away? There's a lot going on. We got to wait for heaven to find out. But he was lifted up. And not only was he lifted up, he surrendered his life, he died, they buried him, and he rose again and was seen by 500 people at one time, risen from the dead. He's conquered it. You know you're a sinner? Anybody here been disobedient to your parents? You have been bitten. And God must judge you. And all I have to do is confess, Lord, I need you. I surrender my life, change it. And he'll heal you. You mean this section of the Old Testament is more or less further explained and fulfilled in the New Testament? Yes, because it's one book. You don't understand Moses raising up the servant in the wilderness unless you've read Numbers. And we haven't even gotten to Balaam yet. We never will the way you're going. Okay, fine. <laughs> Rebuke received. So the people came to Moses, verse 7, and said, We have sinned. Step one to eternal life. Admit you're a sinner. We've spoken against the Lord. Step two to eternal life. Realize you've offended God. Step three, pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpents. Step three, ask him to forgive you. And Jesus said he would come into your heart. And he'll wipe, wipe away the ordinances of the handwriting against you, Colossians tells us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto him, make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole. It shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, are you bitten tonight? You had enough poison? Tired of burning? Thirsty as all can be because your heart is so desperately empty and you keep trying to fill it with other stuff and nothing satisfies. Ask him for his living water. Everyone that's bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass, if a serpent had bitten any man, note this, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Not enough to know it's there. Not enough to be in the same part of the wilderness. It's not until you look in faith. Lots of people sit in church, yet have never looked to Jesus by faith and asked his forgiveness. Not enough to be in the shadow of it. You have to ask. You have to look for yourself. <laughs> Moses must have been tempted to grab heads like, look, look, just look. I don't want to, I don't want you know. Human nature. So verse 10, the children of Israel set forward, pitched in Oboth, 
due south of the Dead Sea, which you can kind of see on the map there, hit pitch to know both, which is in the wilderness before Moab. That's uh, by the table here of scale, but we'll get to it in a minute. From toward the sun rising, looking east. From thence they moved and they pitched in the valley of Zered. Okay, now we can start doing some circles. There's the Zered River down at the bottom. What's that lead into? The Valley of Zered. Wonderful, good. Glad everybody can hopefully see it to some level in the back there. Pays to be up front, just saying. In the Valley of Zered, from thence they were moved and they pitched on the other side of Arnon. And here's the Arnon River, which that is close to what town? Arnon. Okay, wonderful. Pitched near Arnon, which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coast of the Amorites. So this is the region of the Amorites. Ammon or Amorites are up here. Moabites are here. It's on the edge of it. That's the idea of coasts in the old King James, the urge, edge of its territory. The coast of the Amorites, for Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. And here's Moab, and here's the Ammonites, or Amorites, Ammonites, sorry, and here's the Arnon River. So it's basically in the middle. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, that's one I want to find, what he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon, and at the stream of the brooks that go down to the dwelling of Ar, and here is Ar of Moab. Ar of Moab. Where are you from? Ar, baby. Ar. There they are. Moab. Lieth in the border of Moab. And from thence, verse 16, they went to beer. Now, I know that's your story in college, but that's not what it means here. Beer here means well, and they even tell you what it means. They went to beer, that is, the well. <laughs> Just in case, never mind. Whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gather the people together, and I will give them water. And then Israel sang this song, spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. So beer, or beer, means well. And the princes dig the well, and the nobles of the people digged it by direction of the lawgiver with their staves. And from the wilderness, they went to Matana, and from Matana to Nathaniel, um, or Nathaniel, you try it. Nathaliel, from Nathaliel to Bamoth, and then from Bamoth, so here we are working our way up, here's Bamoth, right over here, if you can see it. So they're working north, for the rest of you who are listening in the car radio saying, where in the world are they? They went north, running alongside the Dead Sea, heading north into what would be toward Amman, Jordan, modern day, to Bamoth in the valley, which is the country of Moab, to the top of Pisgah, Pisgah, I have it? Yes. Pisgah is here. It's hard to see. It's in this little crinkle. The area of Pisgah is where the Lord will bring Moses and show him the land. Moses doesn't enter in. He gets to see it from here. I'm going to give you a little conundrum, otherwise known as a who to thunk it. Have the children of Israel at this time crossed the Jordan River? Answer? No. Good. Those who said no, very good. So until they cross the Jordan River, they have not divided the land into its 12 parcels. Yes? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yet Moses sits here at Pisgah, and when he looks into the land, which, by the way, you can see if there's no pollution. If you're here, for example, in Jerusalem, you see the mountains of Moab. It's that close, right? So and if you go with us, we point them out to you. Get rid of all the pollution from Jerusalem. You can see down into the Mediterranean. You can see down through here. They had watchtowers, just structures. They'd light fires for signals, and you could tell from where they're going. So when it was clear, you could see a lot. But what Moses sees is not only from Beersheba, Beersheba down here at the bottom. He sees all the way up past towards the north there near Haifa and above towards the area of Lebanon, which means he sees farther than the human eye should be able to see. And not only does God show him all the land, but he shows them the land and names it by its tribal inheritance. But they haven't crossed the river yet. So, and when they get their tribe, they go down, they send the surveyors, they get 12 plots, they put that in one urn, they get the 12 tribes, they put it in the other urn, and then they take a plot and they take a name and they hold it up and Judah gets, boom, this territory. In other words, for you computer people, it is a random chance generator. But it hasn't happened yet. And God's already calling the territories as though the drawing has been done. 
So they haven't even shown up yet to do the survey, the drawings and the dividing and call the names. And God's already giving the answer before they've even done the effort. What am I getting at? He knows the end from the beginning. We had a family last night. Their flight was delayed an hour and a half. They got home late. About nine minutes from their home, their neighbor called. Their house had caught on fire, struck by lightning. Had they been on time, they'd be dead. God knows. When you ask for traveling mercies, you never know what that means, do you? He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what these territories will be, and they haven't even crossed over yet and tried to divide them by lot. Pisgah is where Moses sees this, by name. But we have to come back for Deuteronomy to get that. Spoiler alert. So they came to Pisgah. Wonderful. Top of that mountain, which looks towards Jeshimon, heading west, is the idea of the wilderness. Verse 21, and Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites. And so we're getting into this area of the Amorites here. Okay, and then we have, let's see, uh, land of the Amorites here, if you can see this at all. And so here's Sihon's kingdom. He's in this territory. And down here is the area of Moab. Wonderful. You got roughly an idea. And over here, by the way, is modern day Israel. Here is the West Bank. This is technically Jordan today, heading up into on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, what would become the Golan or the Golan Heights, which are now Israeli territory again. So this is happening. They get to Jeshimon. They sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through thy land. Bonus question. Who are the Amorites and Moabites descended from? Don? Who are the Moabites, Moab of the father, and the Ammonites descended from? Lot and his two daughters. See, pays to read Genesis. He came to Sihon, king of the Ammonites, saying, Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn unto the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well, but we will go along the king's highway. So we'll behave. We'll work our way up here the main road. King's Highway, until we be past thy borders. And Sihon would not suffer, verse 23, Israel to pass through his border, but Sihon gathered all his people together, went out against Israel into the wilderness, and he came to Jahaz, and he fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and possessed the land from Arnon on the Jabbok. So I think I have him here. Here is the, ja the Arnon River. Here's the Jabbok River. By, by the way, if Jabbok sounds familiar, that is where Jacob wrestled with the Lord, for those who are keeping track. So from Arnon to the Jabbok River, they took care, captive, cap, uh, took captive this area. And so unto the children of Ammon from the border, the children of Ammon was strong. Verse 25, and Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelled in all the cities of the Amorites and Heshbon, and the villages thereof, for to Heshbon, which is this area heading up, here is Heshbon, this region. For in Heshbon was the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land out of his hand, even unto Arnon. Wherefore, they that spake in Proverbs, saying, Come unto Heshbon, let the city of Sihon be built and prepared. For there is a fire gone out of Heshbon, a flame under the city of Sihon. It is consumed, Ar of Moab, and the lords of the high places of Arnon. Woe to thee, Moab, for thou art undone. O people of Chemosh, one of the idols that they would worship that would often involve child sacrifice. Solomon gets sucked into it later to Israel's shame. O people of Chemosh, he hath given his sons that escaped and his daughters into the captivity of Sihon, king of the Amorites. We have shot at them, Heshbon, is perished even under Dibon. Uh, keep going. And we have laid them waste even under Nephath, Nephath, sorry, which is reached under Bediba. Thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. And Moses sent the spy out, Jazer, and they took the villages thereof, and they drove out the Amorites that were there. And they turned, and they went up by the way of Bashan. So this is the area here going into Bashan, towards the, basically just below the Sea of Galilee on the eastern side of the Jordan, the area of Bashan. And Og, otherwise known as Og, king of Bashan, went out against them, and all his people for the battle at Edri. And you're thinking, you've totally lost me. There is Edri, the green circle. 
So they're just working their way north, taking one territory down after the other. God's delivering them into their hands. And Moses is getting to see this and be part of it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand and all his people in his land, and thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. And so they smote him and his sons and all the people until there was none left him alive, and they possessed his land. So, the children of Israel, chapter 22, set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho, which puts you right there in that green oval. These are the plains of Moab. This is the valley of Siddim, basically the idea near Sihon's former kingdom. And you've got right here, Jericho. So they end up here. Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites up here, wiping them out, Og and Sihon, these other areas, Bashan. Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. They're going to consume us. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. And he sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam. Balaam means not of the people. Balak, by the way, meaning basically um, devastator. And Zippor means sparrow, if you've been looking for that. Therefore, he sent messengers unto Balaam, the son of Beor, which is burning, to Pethor, which means soothsayer, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people to call him. Most agree he is on the western bank of the Euphrates, so head up into Syria, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, again, up to perhaps two and a half million. They abide over against me. So come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too many for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, that I may drive them out of the land, for I wot not, that is, I know not, or I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. The elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination, think cash, in their hand, and they came unto Balaam, and they spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you again word as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came to Balaam. Now I know what you're thinking. Wait a second. Who is this dude? And how is he hearing from God? Well, you know, there are other people besides just the Israelis who have had a relationship with the true and living God. Melchizedek, remember him? Prince of Salem, king of Salem, king of righteousness. He had a relationship with the true and living God. So who's this guy? Well, whoever he is, verse 9 tells us, God came unto Balaam. And he said unto him, what men are these with you? Balaam said unto God, we're out of time. we we'll have to pick it up next week. No, he doesn't actually say that, but I said that because we are out of time. We have to pick it up next week. And besides, you've had enough geography for one night. Let's stand, let's pray. Read ahead. Read ahead. If you have any questions, it's Stephen at ccchestersprings.com. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. You make it so simple. Bit by the serpent, you look at the brazen serpent, you're healed. You messed up, but God made a way. You don't want to do that, you own your mess up. That's pretty simple. Lord, I think of those right now listening on the radio, they're driving down the road or wherever they may be. They've missed the entire geography map lesson. But hopefully they got the main picture. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of your glory. We all face that judgment of God. We know it in our heart of hearts. We know it, that little taste in the back of our mouth when we've done something unusually wrong. You laid that into every human being. 
In fact, you tell us in your word you've said eternity in their hearts. And so, Lord, I pray this evening for anyone there listening somewhere, somehow, some way to this chapter of Numbers. They realize they're perishing in their sins. Let tonight be the night they look up. Let tonight be the night they confess they're a sinner and they need Jesus as their Savior. Let tonight be the night they thank you for paying for their salvation and finishing the work on the cross. Let tonight be the night that they thirst no more, but they receive your Holy Spirit, that living water, flowing from within them, and for the first time, perhaps, in their life, find themselves truly at peace and satisfied. Thank you, Lord, you tell us, if we will open when you knock, you will come in, and you will fellowship and sup with us. And so, Lord, bless your church. A lot of things are happening right now in the world that you warned us would come. We really don't know how many more months, weeks, days, or years we have. But may there be that expectancy in our heart. May our joy overflow. Because we see, Lord, you are putting things finally in place to make it all right. So even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and until you return, may we stand for you in your truth with great joy. In Jesus' name, amen.